One of the things that the research shows is that the path to happiness is really paved with gratitude, taking time to appreciate all the good things in life. Welcome, everyone. This is Crazy Good Turns, the podcast that recognizes and celebrates people who do crazy good things for other people. I'm your host, Frank Blake. We have a really interesting, I'd say a fascinating guest with us today, Dr. Lori Santos. Dr. Santos is a professor of psychology at Yale University, and among other things, she teaches Yale's most popular class, in fact, I think it's most popular class ever, Psychology and the Good Life. She also has a podcast called The Happiness Lab, which I've listened to. You ought to take a listen to it. It's really interesting. In it, she explores the science of happiness. Lori, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me on the show. Terrific. So I'm looking forward to getting into some of the connections between happiness or the good life and doing for others. But before that, I'm really curious about when did the idea for this course come to you? Yeah, so the the class came in part because I took on a new role at Yale. So I've been teaching at Yale as a professor for over a decade. Um, But just a couple years ago, I took on a new role where I became one of Yale's heads of colleges. And so so a head of college lives on campus with students. They're kind of like a faculty presence in student life, which means I, I live with the students. I eat with them in the dining hall. I see them in the coffee shop. And that was when I realized that, you know, college students aren't as happy as I remember being when I was in college. You know, we're, we're living through this so-called mental health crisis among young people where over 40 percent of students report being too depressed to function. Over 60 percent say that they feel overwhelmingly anxious. You know, you see suicidal thoughts in more than one in 10, like regularly. Um, you know, so so students just weren't as happy as I remembered. And, and that was particularly frustrating for me as a psychologist because we know lots about the simple kinds of things you can do to feel happier on a regular basis. Basis. And so the class came about because I thought, well, I should teach students all these insights. You know, I should teach them what they're doing wrong and what they could do better to really improve their well-being. And so I, you know, slapped all these insights together as part of a new class. You know, I assumed like, you know, 30 or 40 students would take it. Um, you could imagine my shock when I walked into a classroom of 1,200 students. <laughs> 12, um, 1,200 students? Yeah, just under 1,200. It was around wow. one out of every four students enrolled in the class the first time it was taught. Um which I think was cool. I mean, I think it, it shows that students are voting with their feet. You know, they don't like this culture of feeling overwhelmed and stressed and so self-focused. And I think they really wanted some scientific answers about what they could do better. How much did you know about the science around this, uh, the psychology of happiness when you started? I mean, had you already done a lot of work on that? Yeah, it's not exactly my own personal research focus. I, I more focus on sort of the origins of cognition and cognitive biases. But but it was really related in part because, you know, what we know about the science of happiness is that we kind of get it wrong. Like we have these strong intuitions about the kinds of things that will make us happier. You know, more money, you know, higher salary, bigger house, you know, the perfect relationship, all this stuff. It turns out that a lot of those intuitions are wrong. You know, the simple things that bring about well-being aren't always what we expect. And so it kind of fit, even though I wasn't directly doing work on on happiness and the science of happiness, it kind of fit with the work that I was doing on cognitive biases, these ideas that we have these strong intuitions that lead us to behave in in dumb ways when it comes to kind of maximizing (laughs) our well-being. Were there some things that surprised you, I mean, beyond what you thought in your research? Did you come across something and say, boy, I, you know, some of this I could intuit, but that was just shocking. Well, I mean, honestly, you know, I'm, I'm a human too, right? So if I'm saying, you know, most humans have these bad intuitions, that means I myself, even as a professor of this class, have bad intuitions too. And, and I definitely have some, some really strong, not so smart ones when it comes to the science of happiness. I mean, you know, one, one of the things that the research shows is that, you know, the path to happiness is really paved with gratitude, right? You know, taking time to appreciate, you know, all the good things in life. And that's not something, honestly, that comes naturally to me. You know, I'm, I'm more of a complainer than a, a blessings counter, um, you you know, but that's something I've learned to kind of to kind of override. You know, I've 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 seen the science that like, oh, you know, when I hang out with friends and I kind of complain about the people at work or something, like that's not good. Like that's not the kind of thing that improves my well being. Even though I have this intuition that it'll make me feel better. Um, you know, another one I've seen a lot is intuitions about free time. You know, we often think you know we have to fill our time with all this stuff. You know, especially we're we're talking now in the midst of the holiday season, and I think this is an especially busy time. We think you know party right. after party, you know event after 
after event. But the research shows that more free time is going to make you happier. That saying no a lot is the kind of thing that, that leads to improved well-being. And, and that's another thing I really struggle with, even as the person who teaches this class. Really? So, so do you have something, some theory of the case for why our brains lead us in the wrong direction on this, why we make these common errors? Yeah, I mean, honestly, that's the million-dollar question. I mean, our brains lead us astray in lots of different domains, you know, so, so it's not unique to the field of happiness. I think the problem is that the things that make us happier – are things that might we, we might have naturally come by in our evolutionary past. So, so take social connection. One of the biggest things that the research suggests can really improve well-being. If you want to be like happy people, you need to spend more time with others and you need to prioritize time with the people you care about. You know, this wasn't something we had to worry about back in the evolutionary day, you know, when we were hunter-gatherers in the field. Like, we'd naturally get social connection. You know, it's only in the modern day when we live in these cities where we're, so many of us are anonymous, where we have, you know, phones and technology that, you know, we can play on without talking to someone, I think we didn't really need mechanisms to cause us to seek these things out because we naturally did it. Um, and then take the topic of this podcast, you know, doing nice things for others. I think, you know, back in the day, we were just part of communities where we couldn't help but do that rewarding thing of kind of taking into account other people's feelings and doing nice things for others. That was just sort of part of the way we lived. You know, nowadays, I think we have systems that allow us to feel more selfish or that allow us to be anonymous and maybe not take the time we need for community and doing nice things for others. So I think part of the problem was that we didn't really need those intuitions back then because those behaviors that improved our well-being happened more naturally. We kind of need better intuitions nowadays. That's such an interesting point. And I, again, I've encouraged people to listen to your podcast because you had an interesting discussion around sharing of photos, which is sort of a, now a generational attribute uh, and ha how it has both pluses and minuses in terms of happiness and genuine sharing. Are there, are there uh, pieces of research around being kind or generosity that uh, particularly stand out for you? Yeah, th there's lots and lots of work on this kind of error. I think, you know, when we think about what will improve our well-being, we often think of self-care. You know, these days you can find, like, pillows with self-care and whole self-care <laughs> websites and books and things. Um, or, or another one, uh, I think this is a Parks and Rec's quote, uh, treat yourself, you know, like you get T-shirts with this, right? And, and so I think we have this intuition that, you know, doing nice things for ourselves is what's going to improve our well-being. But the research just plainly suggests that that's not the case. Um, the, the first set of findings come from studying really happy people, which is what a lot of this work does. It goes out and finds people who report being happy, and it just asks how these people behave. And what you find when you do this is you find that happy people are really other-oriented. Um, uh, like controlled for income level, they give more to charity. Happy people give more to charity than not so happy people. Um, and, and that's true kind of worldwide. You can see this correlation, um, again, across incomes, across countries, and so on. Also, happy people uh, tend to volunteer more. They give more of their time to other people. Um, but, but again, you could say, I mean, that's a, th those findings are cool, but they're problematic scientifically because they're just a correlation. And so we don't know if, like, doing nice things for others makes you happy or if you're happy, maybe you tend to do nice things for others. Um, the good news is that we now have lots of experiments in, in some sense that force people to do nice stuff for others and tries to see whether or not that makes you happier. Um, there's some lovely work on this topic uh, by Liz Dunn and Mike. Norton and some of their colleagues, uh, in, in one famous study, they just walk up to people on the street and hand them some money, and they say, either by the end of the day, please spend this money on yourself, or by the end of the day, please spend this money to do something nice for someone else. And what they find is at the end of the day, people self-report being happier when they spent the money on other people. Um, they also did an experiment to show that this isn't people's intuitions. They asked another group of subjects, you know, if you were in this experiment, which of these conditions would make you happier? And people really strongly thought that the condition that would make them happier was treat themselves, you know, spend money on yourselves. Um, and so I think this, this experiment is cool because it shows us two things. One is really causally, if you do stuff for nice, if you do nice stuff for other people, that will make you happier. But also that's not our intuition. And that means that our intuition is going to be telling us to treat ourselves, but do Doing that isn't going to work as well as simply doing something nice for others. That is fascinating. And do you think do you think that uh, the self reporting of happiness is reliable? In I mean, how do they how do they control for whether people think they ought to be saying something or whether they genuinely feel it? 
Yeah, and so this this is a struggle for happiness researchers because, you know, I wish there was a thermometer we could give people for happiness where we just stick it in their mouth and we could say, oh, you're, you know, 8 out of 10 happy or something. You know, that doesn't really exist. Um, but the industry standard really is to ask people, you know, which can feel kind of like, wow, you're just having people self-report. You know, is that really science? But what we know from the research that the simple question of, you know, how satisfied are you with your life today or, or tell me how many positive emotions you experience today, it turns out that that correlates with lots of stuff that we – no is really scientifically rigorous. Things like uh, how much you smile on a daily basis or, you know, detailed self-reports from your family members and friends about how happy you are or even things like a text analysis of your, you know, latest tweets or something like that. Um, these kind of simple self-report measures where you just tell me how happy you are, it turns out they're pretty scientifically valid even though we don't expect them to be. And so that's kind of what people use. My guess is if people, you know, used even more rigorous methods, we'd get the same thing. It would just be, you know, more time consuming and expensive for the scientists. So I, I bet you get lots of feedback and challenge from students. What are some of the comments that come up most frequently? Yeah, well, I think, you know, students have the same strong intuitions that I do and that many people do, you know. So so sometimes they want to challenge these findings. Um, you know, one that I get a lot of challenge from in terms of but Yale students really kind of have trouble with is this idea that money doesn't make us happy. Um, the research shows that money will only make you happy if you're basically living below the poverty line. Um, in fact, there's research from Danny Kahneman and Angus Deaton showing that uh, if you earn about 75K in the U.S. right now, getting any more money isn't going to improve your well-being, basically, really? on, most, on most measures of well-being. And again, not something we expect. You know, you look at people yeah. playing the lottery, you know, switching jobs to get higher salaries. But again, if you're above that threshold, seems like it's not going to work. Um, you know, all my Yale students, um, but by the way, the average salary the Yale student makes after leaving Yale is around 76000 so right, they're not, they're right. not, they don't so need to worry about it. They come this. out happy. Yeah, so they're going to plop out in their first job pretty happy. But, but you know, they don't think that, right? You know, so I had a line of students after I presented these findings, you know, just ready to say, well, you know, well, what if I, you know, live in a big city? Or, like, what if I, you know, like, give, you know, do different things with the money and so on? And so um, so these intuitions are really challenging. Um, but, but a different kind of comment I get from students is that when they try the things that we know work, it turns out they feel better. You know, I have cases of students who are, you know, trying to follow this mantra of doing nice things for others, even at a busy time of year, you know, and would say things like, you know, I, I was thinking that I was too busy to go do this thing to, you know, help my friend, you know, hand out leaflets for her thesis, but then I did that and it actually felt better. Or, you know, I, I realized when I was really busy with midterms, you know, I didn't feel like I had the time to go, you know, to my volunteer job, but I did that and I left actually feeling better, right? And so I, I think this is the thing that students realize is that if you just try these different behaviors that we know improve well-being, we don't expect them to work, but in the end, they actually work a lot better than we often think. So I'm really, I, I read up about your course, and you include, just apropos of what you were just saying, you include rewirement assignments that I guess are designed to rewire the brain away from unhappiness toward more happiness. What, what are examples of those kinds of assignments? Yeah, well, we use the term rewirement, you know, kind of cheekily, you know, as a sort of dorky professor move, you know, because we have course requirements, you know, like a midterm and final paper and things. And so the course rewirements were kind of these practices there to rewire a student's habits. Um, but but they were all the things that the science suggests really work. So there was one week where students had to take time to make a social connection, you know, talk to someone new and really try to get to know them. Um, a week where students, you know, as, as part of, you know, as the kinds of teaching you're t saying in this podcast, you know, had to do random acts of kindness for other people. Um, there are also weeks where students had to take time for gratitude or take time off or even prioritize healthy practices, things like exercise and sleep. You know, so those were literally assignments that students had to do uh, week by week. And again, the goal was to do two things. One is to just get them to do this stuff, which we know can improve their well-being, um, but also to sort of turn these types of healthier behaviors into habits. You know, if you do this kind of thing for a week, then over time it can become the kind of thing that feels more rote. And that was really the goal is to make these healthier behaviors the kinds of things that students might just do naturally. That's fascinating. And do the students report 
back afterwards? Yeah, well, one thing we didn't do in the in the course, and that was in part because we didn't realize the course was going to be so big, was that, you know, as, as a scientist, I really wish I had taken kind of pre and post data, you know, before happiness and after happiness. Um, we didn't really get it together to get, you know, approval from Yale in time to do it as a real study. So all I have are people's anecdotal data, but what we find anecdotally is that doing these practices really does make students happier. Um, the ones I hear about the most are students taking time for gratitude. You know, this is not popular among young people these days, you know, it's not a culture of gratitude. It's really a culture of kind of complaining and, you know, even entitlement in certain ways, you know, feeling like you deserve this stuff and you're not kind of getting the service that you want. But students who really took time for gratitude, you know, reported all these wonderful things, you know, cases of a student who'll say, you know, it's the middle of midterms and, you know, I feel like there's a lot of pressure, but in the morning I take time to realize, you know, like, like my parents are alive, like my grandparents are alive, like the people I love are safe and they're there. And like, you know, everything else that comes, it's going to be okay. Like those things are still in place. And so, you know, again, just a moment to do that can give you the grounding you need and the resilience you need to kind of make it through some of the tougher stuff. Um, and so we find that, you know, students who are doing those kinds of practices uh, seem to get happier. Do you do you have a broader thought, and and I sort of get uh, glimpses of this in your in your podcast about how our digital age uh, either enables or cuts against what these basic you know rewirement assignments might be. Yeah, I mean, again, the, the technology is really just a tool, right? And so it could be a tool that we use for good to sort of promote the behaviors that improve well-being, or it can be a tool that we use for not so good, you know, things that can detract from these behaviors. Um, so it isn't inherently good or bad. Right. The problem is that if you look at what we tend to use technology for, it, it's not really enhancing the behaviors we know scientifically can improve well-being, which is kind of ironic, you know. So take social connection. Um, you know, the, the, most of the technology we're talking about are phones, right? You know, in theory, a phone could be really a good device for making us connected to people that are far away. And, of course, it does that a little bit. But oftentimes it gives us the sort of neutral suite of social connection. You know, we're not really talking to a live person in real time. You know, we're, we're texting them kind of off cycle, which, you know, is, is connection, but not really the way matters for our well-being. Um, or we're scrolling through an Instagram feed or a Facebook feed. You know, it feels like we're connecting with people, but not really, not in the way that makes, you know, a real impact on our well-being. And so, and often it's at an opportunity cost of really connecting with people. You know, when I'm in a, a, a line of people at a coffee shop, I could be chatting with them, but I'm often not. I'm often, you know, checking email on my phone. Or, you know, when I'm on a plane, you know, and I could chat with the person next to me, you know, when the, the plane lands and things, often I'm, you know, quickly, you know, checking in on what happened on social media and, and not talking to the real people. So that's social connection. I think phones are, are bad for a lot of the things we mentioned. You know, I think even things like gratitude and being other-oriented, you know, things like social media feeds where we have all this social comparison, that can cause us to feel a little selfish or a little entitled or to feel like we're not doing as well as other people. It can cause us to complain and so on. Um, even the healthy behaviors, things like sleep, um, are things that are negatively affected by having this technology around. Um, I heard this scary statistic recently that of 15-year-olds who have smartphones over 80% sleep with them, you know, the, their alarm clock, right? And so that means that those devices that are incredibly tempting are kind of right by a student's bed um, when they're sleeping, which potentially could, you know, of course, it's distracting. It causes them to want to check, you know, what's going on on the internet, and that uh, can prevent sleep. It's one of the reasons that, you know, college students report not getting enough sleep every night. So before you embarked on this course, you were a cognitive psychologist, uh, to those of us who aren't really familiar with what that means, what does a cognitive psychologist do? Well, cognitive science is just the study of how people think uh, and how people make decisions. And so cognitive scientists sort of study, you know, how people do that. And they can do that by studying humans. They can do that by comparing humans with other animals. That's what I did. I um, looked at human cognition and compared that with cognition in other animals. Um, but again, what the, really the question is, is, you know, for me at least, the question in cognitive science that I was most interested in is this question of how do we go wrong? You know, where are those biases that are inherent, maybe so inherent that they're shared with other animals that seem to lead us astray. Uh, I started doing that in the context of decision-making and even uh, cases like economic decision-making. And now I sort of apply that in the domain of well-being. You know, where are our biases leading us astray, causing us not to improve on well-being in ways that we, we should be? 
So one of the things in doing this podcast that I kind of reflect on from time to time is, is first, your basic, uh, your basic premise seems so right that the people who are doing crazy good things for other people do seem happier. But there is also a side note to that, which is a lot of times seeing the need and seeing, uh, you know, no matter how famous or, you know, how much progress they're making, there's so much more that needs to be done and how that weighs on them. It struck me that a little bit you're in the same situation. You've now become famous. People reference you for being uh, someone to talk to about happiness. Uh, how much of that is a positive for you and how much of it is, oh, gosh, I just wish more people were understanding this, more people were doing it? Yeah, it's, it's, I'm, to be honest, it's been a little surreal. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. I started this class in January of 2018, you know, honestly just trying to get my Yale students to, you know, keep a gratitude journal and sleep. You know, I just wanted, you know, some of them to be a little happier. Uh, and it's turned into this much bigger thing, you know, where, you know, I'm on your podcast. I have my own podcast. You know, I've been on national news. Um, right. And so, yeah, so it's been a little surreal. But, no, you're but I, legitimately famous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I think by and large that's mostly been an amazing thing, right? I mean, in part, you know, because of what we're talking about on this podcast, which is the, the you know the fact that I've I've received this sort of attention means that I can share some of these insights with other people. And what's been amazing is so many people will spontaneously you know email me or send me letters saying how much this stuff has helped them. You know, I have I have learners in our we have an online version of the class, and so we do a lot of these tips online on Coursera.org. We've released the class completely for free. And so we sometimes get learners who will write in, having taken that class, saying, you know, I started taking the class when I was suicidal, and and now I'm okay, and thank you so oh, much. Wow. And so, you know, it's it's amazing, right? And so I think by and large, you know, 99.99% of the attention we've gotten has been positive. I think the only struggle I have, and, and again, it's a struggle that many people have, is that, you know, that you can only do so much, right? And so um, I have to say no to a lot of opportunities where I'd get a chance to help people, and that can feel frustrating. Um, um, but I also know that the research shows that time affluence, this idea of being wealthy in your own time, sort of having a little free time, you know, that's pretty critical for my own happiness. That's really critical for my own resilience, my ability to keep doing this. And so it's it's been a little bit of a balance. But but by and large, it's been amazing. You know, if you'd asked me two years before the course, you know, do you think four million people would be hearing your lesson and, and learning from it and getting good tips and you'd be helping them? I'd be like, what are you talking about? And so it just means really we can do great things for others at a scale that that's not typical in the human you know in the human species it is a crazy good thing can people still register for your class yeah so the class is available online at coursera.org it's called the science I'm of sorry would you would you spell that <clears throat> sure it's course c o u r s e r a Dot org. Um, and so that's the, called the Science of Well-Being, and you can uh, sign up. There's kind of continuous sign-ups, uh, and it's just a short six-week version of the class, but a really great way to kind of do a, a short version of what the Yale students do. You'll, you'll hear some lectures about the science, but you'll also have to do those rewirements where you have to do the practices, too. You get homework. Um, but another way to learn more is to check out the, the Happiness Lab podcast. Uh, we'll, we'll launch a, a, a new season in 2020, a kind of new year, new you, that's specifically tips about the things you can do to improve your well-being in the new year. No, I highly recommend your podcast. It's really interesting. You have very interesting discussions. What has been, in doing the podcast, what's been your biggest aha moment? Well, I think, you know, the, the podcast is is fun for a couple of reasons. One is that you know, you get to really hear the stories of the people who are putting these tips into practice. And that's something you don't often get, you know, in a kind of standard science lecture about things. You know, the podcast really allows us to tell people stories. And I think those stories are really compelling when you hear people who've who've gotten away from their intuitions, who are doing it right, and they've seen the benefits. I mean, that's been really incredible just for me to see. Um, but I think the thing that's been my, my biggest aha moment in the podcast, and I think you'll hear that in kind of the episodes, is, is how bad I am, you know, it's 
some sense how much I'm learning <laughs> from these people. And, and that's a critical point, uh, I think, and an important one, which is that the science suggests you can you can know what all these studies say. You know, you can know the kinds of things you're supposed to do. But until you put those things into practice, nothing's really going to change in terms of your well-being. And I think that's very important. You have to get out there and do it. And it's one of the reasons I love your podcast so much because it's really about the people who, who are doing these things. You know, it's not, it's not lip service to charity or lip service to good ideas. It's really like getting out there and doing them, which can take some work. No, they go, uh, for most of the people we feature, they go all in. And I think it's one of the things that uh, most people are scared of doing that. And then you hear their stories and you go, oh, my gosh, that's amazing. And it's amazing what it's done for them and for others. Um, so if you, were, if, if you were to summarize the best habits on the generosity what you what you recommend on the rewirement on just focused on on generosity and doing for others what would they be well, I think it's 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 mostly just doing stuff for others, right? And and it's thinking about the opportunity cost when you do nice stuff for yourself. And I think this is a really critical one. I mean, it's not I mean, I think a lot of us get the notion that it's nice to do nice stuff for others. You know, most of us are pretty empathic and compassionate and motivated to do that. You know, what we forget are the opportunities we have to do that, right? And so, you know, just a quick example, you know, if I'm I'm having a bad day at work, sometimes I'm like, "Oh, I'm going to do something nice to treat myself." You know, I'm going to go out and get, you know, a nice latte or or get a get a manicure or something like that. What I often forget in those moments is that that's a moment that instead of doing something nice for myself, I could do something nice for someone else. You know, so I could walk into the coffee shop and, you know, pay it forward, you know, pay for the next person in line's coffee. Or I could walk into the manicure shop and give someone a manicure or gift a coworker a manicure, right? It's it's in those moments that we forget that there's this opportunity cost of what we could be spending our money on. You know, or or, or take another case, you know, I'm I I've, I've got this clunker of a car and I'm looking at buying a new car and you know, I could buy an expensive one, but you know, if I bought a slightly cheaper one, you know, that's you know some amount of money that I could be giving to charity that I could donate to a cause that I really care about. Um, so, so those I think are the moments that we forget about. There's this opportunity cost of how we could be spending our time, whether it's something selfish or something for other people. There's an opportunity cost on how we could be spending our money, and there are all these little opportunities to kind of do other stuff, do nice stuff for others that we forget. Um, I think the other thing that comes from the science is that. The research shows that the magnitude of what we're doing for others doesn't matter. It's the act of doing it. And oh, so we, wow. That's we, interesting. Yeah. So we know this from some of Liz Dunn's work where she varies the amount of money that she gives people. You know, so you're given $5 on the street and told it to and told to spend it on someone else or on, on, on yourself or given $20. And what she finds is that the magnitude kind of doesn't matter. It's just the act of doing something nice. And I think this is another misconception we have. You know, sometimes we can get in this mode of like, you know, I'm going to give to charity, but, you know, a five bucks like that, you know, feels cheap or something like that, right? Or, you know, I'm going to do something nice for others, but I really don't have that much time. Um, what the research shows is that you can get the bump in well-being just by the act of doing something. You know, it doesn't have to be a lot. Um, it, just, it just has to be the act of kind of thinking through that this is about someone else and that you're really trying to help. Um, I think the third thing I would suggest is just this idea that um, the more we can see the the fruits of our nice things to others, the happier we get. And so, you know, if you're going to pay it forward and give someone the coffee, you know, stick around to peek and see what that person's reaction is. Um, th there's really research showing that we get this kind of warm glow, this sort of great feeling from watching good things to happen to other people. And so if at all possible, try to see um, how a person reacts to the good thing that you're doing. Try to, try to get some sense of, of how that played out because that can really kind of boost your well-being uh, and kind of make you realize how important your action really was for another person. Those are so uh, profound and important. I, I'm, as you're going through those, I'm referencing some of the folks that we've highlighted on this podcast, and your last one just reminded me there's a, a guy named Jordan Caslow who's a phenomenal eye doctor who's got this amazing charity called uh, Vision Spring that helps with eyesight around the world. But it all started with his giving the proper set of eyeglasses to one young boy in Mexico who was presumed blind and the smile from that boy. And that's what connected with him. I mean, it's, it is the do for one and the personal connection from it. 
Um, and that's going to make just, sense. That's way, the way our mind is wired. You know, yeah. we're, we're just these primates that are meant – that are built to see the reactions of other people around us, you know. So we don't – you know, for better or for worse, we don't want to impact statistics, you know, on some page. Like <laughs> we want to help real people and we want to see them smile. And so, and so the more you can – you know, and it, and that's and that's good and bad, right? You know, like helping one boy in one country is something. Maybe your money could have gone to helping hundreds of people, right? We just don't get the same effect. And so, I think even if you're doing the thing where you're, you know, helping statistically or giving anonymously, like it, as much as possible, if you can sort of see the fruits of that work, try to see the impact it has somehow, that's the thing that's really going to help improve your well-being. And that can even just be imagining it. You know, you know, I, I donate money, you know, on a, on a website to you know victims of a you know a natural disaster or a hurricane or something like that. I'm not necessarily going to see those people, but I can take 30 seconds to imagine you know what it would feel like you know if my house was destroyed, and you know think of a real person that 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 had that happen that that are going to get some funds to fix it and what that's going to feel like. You know, just that imagery can give you the well-being boost that that doing nice things for others really can can bring about. Lori, this has been such a great conversation, and uh, I think everyone is really fortunate that you decided to to uh, take this turn in terms of your research and share it, not just with the Yale students, but uh, online, and as you say, it's a free course online, and I recommend to all of our listeners to uh, check that out and do it, and absolutely to listen to your podcast, which I can vouch for is terrific. Oh, thank and you so I, much. I, and I want to thank you for spending the time and thank you for what you're bringing to light. You know, there is – we should know these things, uh, but the brain is tricky. And we we find lots of ways of getting around it and saying, well, no, you know, actually the extra $10,000 on that car is a great investment. Uh, so I, th- I think your your practical thoughts for how people can put that in place are terrific thoughts. Oh, thank you so much. And thanks for spreading the message of people doing good stuff. I think another thing is that we, we you know, the news cycle today isn't often about people doing good things for others. You know, we right. often hear about the bad stuff. And just the act of realizing like, oh, this is part of humanity too. This is the kind of thing people can do. I think that's doing really important work for reminding people that this is possible, that this is the kind of thing a lot of good people do, and that they should think about doing it themselves. And when does your second season on the podcast start? It's going to launch uh, sometime this April will be season two. And uh, they will also have a little mini season starting January 6th in 2020. And that's going to be the New Year, New You mini season. Oh, nice. Oh, terrific. Perfect for New Year's resolutions. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Lori. Really appreciate it. And I hope uh, all of our listeners take the time to listen to your podcast and look at your course. Awesome. Thank you so much. Really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. That was Lori Santos. I hope you enjoyed the conversation, and I encourage you to listen to her podcast, The Happiness Lab. Our show is recorded at Listen Up Studios in Atlanta. Thank you, Greg. Editing by Stephen Key and mixing by Score Score in Los Angeles. And special thanks to our production team of Brian Sabin and Megan Hanlon. Until next time, this is Frank Blake thanking you for listening and celebrating another crazy good turn.